And I want to begin with the context for tonight's news with a fascinating time capsule from Thursday, which we now know today was more momentous than anyone understood at the time in Bob Mueller's investigation. Consider this. On Thursday, Mike Flynn signed his plea deal. That didn't break till Friday. And he signed that he admitted making false statements, a.k.a. lies to the FBI. It was, we now know, hours later that Bob Mueller's team directly called Paul Manafort's lawyer to say they discovered that Manafort had been communicating with a Russian with alleged ties to Russian intelligence about ghostwriting an op-ed that Mueller says is a violation of the current bail deal. And now the plot thickens further. A federal judge ordering Manafort to prove that he didn't violate that bail deal, as Bob Mueller alleges, and as that op-ed uh, allegedly explains. And we now know publicly the identity of the Russian that he was contacting. The name is Konstantin Kilimanik, a former member of the Russian army who was working, allegedly, with Paul Manafort to offer secret private briefings about the Trump campaign to a Russian oligarch. Manafort's lawyer has insisted that all the dealings abroad were lawful. There is no evidence that Mr. Manafort or the Trump campaign colluded with the Russian government. He was seeking to further democracy and to help the Ukraine come closer to the United States and the EU. Joined now by former federal prosecutor Barbara McQuaid and the former U.S. ambassador to Russia, Michael McFaul. Uh, Barbara, have you ever seen anyone violate a bail deal quite like this? No, I never have. And, you know, usually when somebody is um, uh, newly charged and is under uh, bond conditions and is negotiating for the terms of those conditions, they're incredibly humbled and on their best behavior. If these allegations are true, they're really astonishing uh, that Paul Manafort was ghostwriting an op-ed uh, in violation of the gag order that the judge has issued in this case. No, I've never seen anything like it. How do you think Mueller's investigators would come to know something like that, which they themselves allege in court was secret? I don't know, and they have filed it under seal. I mean, I could only speculate. One way may have been that they were monitoring the communications of the colleague that uh, Paul Manafort was, was dealing with, the Russian, and that he was picked up incidental to that. Um, it is possible that they could have been monitoring Paul Manafort, but only if they believed he was engaging in new criminal activity, and they were authorized to do that by Mueller, um, and that they had a filter team to filter out any attorney-client privilege communication. So that would be fairly extraordinary. So it seems more likely that they uh, collected the information from the other end. From the other end, and we've seen that come up in these intel issues before, Ambassador. Uh, and yet, of course, it brings to mind the famous yeah. Russian saying, wiretap me once, shame on you. Wiretap me twice, shame on me. Wiretap me three, four, five times. What am I doing as a defendant in this case? I mean, doesn't Paul Manafort know when he's calling Russia, as, as you've done many times in your career for lawful purposes, there is a, I would say, significant risk of intelligence interception? Well, first, that's a new Russian saying I didn't know, Ari, so thanks <laughs> no, for the uh, Russian It's not really uh, a Russian there. saying, I have to admit. <laughs> uh, of course. I mean, there's so many strange things about this, as you just discussed. Uh, if he's calling Kiev, it was probably he was calling Kiev, the Russian based in Kiev. It sounds like it was his longtime partner. Why would you be calling a Russian to ghost write an op-ed intended, intended for American audiences? It makes no sense to me. In fact, it makes no, so much no sense that I wonder if there's more to this story. Uh, um, not unlike, by the way, uh, Mr. Flynn uh, lying about his conversations with Kislyak. That makes so much uh, non, it's so nonsensical to me that it suggests to me that maybe there's something more to that story as well. I've heard of a double negative. I feel like you're using a, a super negative. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's so I'm much nonsense. I understand there. what you're saying, Ambassador. So, <laughs> so what, more, what, what more could it be? Maybe, you know, he's got some other business deals he's trying to tidy up. I mean, I, I'm really speculating here. I want to be clear about that. Sure. Uh, but the, the, what, we, what we have been told just is kooky. It makes no sense to me that he'd be reaching out to some Russian former intelligence officer in Kiev to help him ghostwrite an op-ed to influence public opinion in America. Uh, you know, I've dealt with a lot of Russians and Americans and Ukrainians for many decades. 
I've never encountered something like this. Uh, Barbara, I want to turn to the other giant thing that was leaked over the weekend that has not gotten the attention it normally would. Uh, of course, the Trump administration from the president on down has strenuously doubted uh, the finding by the Intelligence Committee that Russia did intervene. And yet, this newly leaked email of KT McFarlane on the transition team states flatly, and I'm quoting, if there's tit-for-tat escalation, escalation, Trump will have difficulty improving relations with Russia, which has just thrown USA election to him. Uh, and an interesting piece in Foreign Policy argues that even the most generous interpretation of that email suggests at the least the Trump campaign knew Russia had intervened in the election, decided to lie systematically from Trump on down about the reassuring outreach it did to Russia during the transition. Uh, your view from a prosecutorial perspective of how incriminating that email is, even as I read uh, from, a, from a generous interpretation of it. Yeah, on its face, it sounds incredibly incriminating, right? I mean, to say thrown the election uh, sounds as if they believe that uh, Russia, in fact, threw the election. But, you know, emails are really tricky, just like text messages. Uh, it's very easy for someone to say, I meant it facetiously. I meant that's what our critics are saying. So I would think that Robert Mueller and his team would want to pin down KT McFarlane and ask her exactly what she meant at the time. And I think before they ask her that question, they would also want to look at other emails that she may have sent, other emails sent in response to try to glean from those uh, what the, co the context was so that they can come from an informed position when right. asking her to explain that. No, I take your point. The shorter the email or text, as you say, the more it can be taken out of context or not be as meaningful. Uh, the great legal scholar Miley Cyrus famously said, if you mean it, I believe it.